Hi, I'm Mike Henry, and this is my Procreate 5 demo for the piece I call It's What's on the Inside That Counts. So that's what I decided to call it, although this is a Draw This in Your Style by Kelly Doty, uh, who I've been a fan of for a long time. I first found her on Ink Master, probably like a lot of other people, and have followed her ever since. Uh, this is her piece right here. Um, I was pretty surprised that she posted up a Draw This in Your Style. I don't think she ever has, so I thought it was just really fun and crazy, so I had to jump in on it. So let's go ahead and look at how I did my version of this piece. I think we'll be able to break down a lot of my decisions sort of as the time lapse goes. So let's start by talking about anatomy. Uh, so she uses a sort of super deformed new school tattoo style with her anatomy, and I wanted to go with more of the anatomy that I usually use. So we've got a little bit of more normal proportions, although still very stylized. Uh, I do a bit of a long neck similar to what she does. Uh, actually, I naturally do a longer neck as well, so that kind of worked out. When trying to find the proportions, since we're not going with as much of a super deformed style, some of the other things start to elongate as well. Things like the horns or just the natural uh, like fingers, arms, all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, we also change the proportions of the face to be less big-eyed, although still quite big-eyed. Uh, and we're trying to bring it a little bit more into the style that I normally work in, so we've also got a bigger mouth and then just other stereotypical shapes that are... Uh, uh, in my style on a regular basis. So when you're trying to do these draw this in your styles, you're trying to find where you are in a healthy way, keeping their stuff and adding your stuff. I think that you need to make it, at least this is my own personal philosophy, you need to make it look that it's obviously a draw this in your style based off of their original piece, but you're just trying to bring in all of the things that are more malleable, things like proportions or the way you interpret a shape. If you're gonna include lines, how you do lines versus how they do lines. So you're just trying to find all of these things that are maybe considered a little on the generic side, meaning they can be flexed and you're still maintaining the original look and feel. I think that if you're somebody who regularly interprets characters in different ways, like let's say in fan art or if you actually have a legit job where you're reinterpreting characters um, or other shapes, I think that you're already kind of pre-trained to do these types of things, which is why I find it to be so fun. I don't find a draw this in your style that much different from, say, the time I redrew Chrono from Chrono Trigger, or the time I redrew Sephiroth, or any of the characters where I draw them and try to interpret them in a different way than how they're originally depicted. So as I've done in the past, like for instance with the uh, Choni Athul, I am trying to color I'm trying to choose my colors without color picking, uh, trying to get in the ballpark but then trying to find the, the, the different color choices that I might make. Uh, it's, it's not as easy on what I would consider the base color. So for instance, if I wanted to interpret this character as being more red skinned, uh, as opposed to the yellow skin that we've got going on here, then I would probably start straying a little too far away from the original. However, in the original, the shadows are a little bit more desaturated and go towards black, and mine don't. So that might be an interesting place where I can still reference the original as far as its raw, flat color is concerned, but then in the rendering and in the way that I'm interpreting the light and color of that, uh, I can find something that's a little bit more me. Uh, so that's what I did here. Now I did this piece in the middle of doing other pieces, like, other, uh, like the, the monster characters that I've been doing recently. So this was a nice break, especially because I did use a different lighting setup than what I use in those, in the sense that here I use a warm shadow, and in those other ones I've been using a purple shadow. So this is like a desaturated orangey red, uh, so it's like a really light tan uh, as my multiply layer for my shadows, and in the, the other pieces that you've been seeing recently, it's been a purple, which traditionally Purple is what I used to use all the time when I would use a multiply shadow layer uh, scenario, and this is kind of the, more of the recent palette where it's been more on the warm shadow side of things. Now, if you're looking at the original and then you look at the state that this is in right now, you'll notice that there are some some of the values are a little brighter. For instance, the hair is a little bit brighter. That's because what I'm trying to do is target that kind of mid range 
because I know I'm going to be applying a shadow as a multiply and then some highlights and trying to hit that mid-range is going to get me the closest to like a starting color. I can always go back in with my flats and alter them later, uh, which I may do. I actually think I kind of nail it right off the bat here. I don't have too much indecision as the piece goes on, uh, but I... Try, I'm trying to approximate that mid-range so that I can then bring it darker with my shadows, bring it lighter with my highlights, and those colors are going to impact the, the undercolor flats, but we're going to stay kind of in the family that we're looking for. Speaking of staying in the family that we're looking for, uh, that color range is also, and choosing these colors is also part of that draw this in your style thing. So something that I'm trying to make sure that I capture when I'm doing this is like the spirit of the materials. Uh, one thing that I don't do really in this is I don't really make the horns particularly shiny. I do add light to them so they get a little bit of sheen on them. Um, and I don't make the eyes go quite as gem-like. So I don't go with like how they get really white in the original towards the bottom, uh, which is just trying to really emphasize that that internal glow factor. Uh, so I don't do some things like that, but I'm trying to make sure everything else kind of reads well. I think also something that's really important to do is look at the details and I don't mean the details like all of these tiny little specks here and there but just some of the smaller decisions like for instance it's very easy to miss like that little squiggly hair coming off of the back so I try to make sure that the hair goes to black so that I can do some of those things like these loose hairs that are flitting about as well as that that hair kind of that inky hair in the background something in Kelly's art as well here is that it does have a line um, and right now I am doing I'm just rendering it so my thoughts throughout it was that I would bring in the line at the end which is something that I've always done here or there on my pieces and recently you've seen it pop up uh, more frequently so I wanted to bring that in because in these draw this in your styles sometimes it is really really fun to pull your version away from it as far as like if it's really heavily lined like do something really really rendered if it's the opposite do the opposite um, but then at the same time I'm looking for ways that that someone who's looking at it might see that sort of that sort of wink in the piece of just like hey look I paid attention to the original and I did this thing that doesn't mean that you have to do that it doesn't mean that you're not paying attention if you don't do it but it's just kind of a fun conversation that you're having with the viewer and potentially even having with the original artist. If they check out your art and they see your version on it, then they might say like, oh, that's cool that that person noticed what I tried to do there. So that's sort of where my headspace is while I'm working on this in general. I'm trying to find all of these opportunities to reference the original while also putting my own unique take on it. A fun little factoid about this piece is I did it while I was watching Clue. So... When I re-watch this video, I'm seeing like Tim Curry running around and being crazy. Mind. So uh, it's uh, fun to go back and re-watch it because I'm re-watching Clue in my brain. Not really, but I might actually re-watch it after I draw this because why not? Or after I draw this, after I record this. I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. All of this isolation has made me completely bonkers. So something that's in the original that I thought was really cool was this paper texture. So we bring the paper texture into the background. Now at this point, I wasn't sure if I was going to put the paper texture on the character. I kind of liked, as, as we're talking about these trade-offs of making it reference the original and making it not reference the original, I was thinking that that might be something I don't do. Since the original has this paper texture and it makes it have this this rough feel, I thought it might be nice to not have that and have the character feel completely smooth, the hair, the weird eyeball coming out, her skin, all of that stuff. Have it have this more refined look so that it has less of that texture. But then towards the end, I thought actually it was missing a little bit of that reference. I felt like it was important to reference that texture, so I throw it in towards the end. Uh, I do separate them though as two completely different textures that I'm controlling. So we'll have the paper texture for the background and then we use the same texture but we cut it out and put it on top of the character so I can control those two levels independently of each other. So the stage we're at now, we're doing the form shadows over the surface. We'll do that. We'll do some direct light shadows that'll be cast. We'll do some highlights. We'll, or not highlights, but just a higher value. And then we'll put in some highlights here or there. And um, we finish off the entire thing 
with the usual bounce light pass, but then also throwing those lines on it. I think the best thing about the draw this in your style stuff is that it can make you try different things. Now, I'm not necessarily trying something totally radical here. I mean, it's like a chick from like the chest up. That's not exactly something that is far from something I would normally paint. However, some of these palettes are different than what I would normally use. I wouldn't necessarily have like this eyeball worm gutsy thing coming out of somebody's chest. Um, I wouldn't even necessarily do um, some of the treatments with like the horns and things like that, that I uh, have to do for this piece. So I think that that is what I, where I think all the value in the draw this in your style is. It actually goes to something I've talked about in the past, which is doing like fan art of characters. There are a lot of people out there that say do it or don't do it, and there's lots of opinions about it. I personally think that doing fan art is actually awesome, but I think that there's sort of a right way and a wrong way to do it. Now, I don't mean that in the case of like you, you if you do fan art a certain way, you're doing it wrong. I mean, if you're doing some fan art, you're drawing other characters, cool, have fun, please do. It's awesome, and anyone who's doing art, do more art, right? Like, there's no reason to stop that from happening. I think that uh, if we're going to sort of reframe it though in the context of a professional and sort of like getting work in a particular industry let's say it's animation or video games or any of the normal stuff that like for instance i might be involved in i think that it's important to try to make the fan art a learning experience as much as possible and by that i mean can you learn from the original character designers of the character that you're doing something about character design and can you analyze while you're in the middle of doing it and learn like oh i see they made the eyes this color for this reason or they made the pants and the shirt these two colors for these reasons i think that that's the important thing and then if you can also then learn and digest why original design is designed the way it is and then you can reinterpret it in a way where people can still recognize it but you've brought something new and fresh to the table that overall is a skill that is incredibly valuable and so while i don't think that anyone should stop themselves from doing fan art and i think that if you're just doing art and fan art is a way you get there i think that's all great i would just emphasize trying to do fan art in a way that is applicable to like a potential gig or a learning opportunity or developing a skill in some way. I think that we all can say how exciting it is when somebody interprets a character in a new and exciting way that still feels like it is true to that character. I, I can't really, I don't really want to cite like one right now, but let's just say we've all seen characters where they've been interpreted poorly and ones where they've been interpreted wonderfully and we know how exciting it is when they've been interpreted wonderfully and i think developing that as a core skill and folding that into your fan art your love of drawing a character is uh, is just extremely valuable so again just to emphasize if drawing fan art is what gets you drawing cool if while you're doing the fan art you can leverage it into something that is like a specific skill that a, a studio or a company or whomever would um, see a lot of value in because you can interpret something in a new and exciting way, I think that is even better. That's like a plus plus to doing that fan art. So to bring it all back around, I think that's what the draw this in your style. I think that's when draw this in your style is at its best. I think that if you stray super far away to where people can't really recognize what the original is that maybe that was a fun drawing for you to do and you still learn something but then you are not necessarily harnessing the learning of can i do something fresh and new and exciting but still have people relate this back to the original and i think that if you make it too much like the original maybe you're not bringing anything to the table that is new and exciting for someone they might just say well i've already seen the original why do i need this one and so you might have missed the opportunity to breathe new life into the spirit of that uh, exercise speaking of the exercise uh, we are getting, we're making progress, let's say, on the uh, 
the form shadows on the AO pass here. Uh, we're trying to de define the hair chunks. I recently saw somebody who was struggling with hair, and I'm definitely not one to say that I am a hair expert. I think that there are other people out there who just do awesome, awesome hair that I'm jealous of. But if I'm going to try and break this down for people, um, I think that there is essentially three uh, aspects to hair. Wow, is that true? <laughs> I'm just like saying shit just to like say it. Um, let's let's say it's three and let's see if I can come up with three. I think first is defining the overall shape of what you're trying to accomplish. And that is things like trying to communicate the overall volume of hair. Maybe you have a character who's the hair is really distinct, it's an iconic shape, and you need to capture that. Or maybe you have a character whose hair has to be achieving something. It could either be something as explicit as like this character's hair turns into a hand and it grabs something. Maybe it's Milia Rage from uh, Guilty Gear. Um, or it's something where it's just part of the composition. So it's the major shapes of the hair and the important thing that that's trying to serve. Then the next part is the clumps, the subgroupings, so that you can actually try to give some interesting form to the interior. If we look here at Kelly's, you can see she does that extremely well, and that's what I'm trying to mimic here. I'm trying to get some of those core chunks that she has uh, defined in mine as well. And then from there, it's trying to then sell the fact that these are individual strands making up the hair. Now, I think that you can do it in a very explicit way. I think that Kelly kind of does an explicit way, but it's still really nice and highly stylized. I think that you could get even more realistic with it by literally defining all those strands in sort of a nice way that it can either be really subtle or it could be really explicit. Um, or you do it in an even more chunked out way. So if you look at the way Kelly's got it, she's got these little fine lines go one level up to the slightly bigger chunks, and that's sort of where I stop. I do those sort of smaller bits where we're just kind of putting some lines in there to show that there is, in fact, it is comprised of some subgroupings. I could go further and like really get uh, additional hair strands in there. And in fact, if you look at some of my art, I don't really know if I've done it that much recently, but if you go way back, you'll probably see some paintings I've done where I've put a lot more of the stranding in. You can see that in, in action there. And there's other people who do it better too. Um, and then, but something else that I sort of do to try and hint at that is like the flyaways. Uh, so you see Kelly doing that in here. I also do it just generally. So when I saw it in here, I was like, oh sweet, I'll be able to do that trick. Um, but if you have these like chunkings, but then you have the flyaways, it tells the brain like, oh, there are smaller pieces here. So if you go back through to some of my other more, more recent stuff, you'll, you'll see examples of that. Usually when I do it, I do it by all this rendering that you're seeing on screen right now. And then as like a, a close to last step, I go through and I just color pick the strands of hair and I pull them out. So there's that level of detail that, like I said, Kelly's hinting at here, but she's still keeping it nice and stylized. Uh, and then there's the next setup, which is like the smaller chunks, which is kind of where I stop aside from my flyaways. And then there's the next setup, which is the interior big chunking, which is in the case of my piece, it's that part that's uh, in front of her horn that's kind of coming down, which is also in Kelly's. That's something I'm referencing. Then these chunks that are like on our side of her face, these little chunks that are coming down like by her cheek and then pulling away and then over her shoulder and then pulling away, which she also has. These are all things I'm trying to reference. And then that bigger shape, which in this case, because it's such a tight shot, it's not as important. We're just really more trying to capture that volume. The thing that's more indicative of the bigger shape here is things like that little inky squiggle in the background, which we will eventually get to. So for me, that breaks down hair. Overall, big shape that's trying to accomplish something, volume, direction, purpose, something like that. Next set down, which is the interior chunk so that we can actually capture the flow and how that hair is actually kind of constructed to get that bigger silhouette. And then we have the interior definition that's trying to, to tell someone this is hair, which can either be high frequency, like lots of little lines to show that there's lots of hair building that, or less frequency where there's just a few that are sort of defining almost like a ribboning that's happening in there.
And that kind of breaks down hair. Now, the last thing I'll say about hair is that th those are the sort of like big implications that builds the hair. It's up to you to define where the shine is, where the shadow is, all of those types of things that actually sells that form. But, but honestly, that's no different than interpreting any material and any form and trying to figure out how your light lays across that topology. One of my boys is like walking through the halls singing something, so hopefully that doesn't come through in the mic. I just like stopped recording for a solid like minute hoping he would quit and he hasn't quit yet, so uh, let's just hope it doesn't come through. Um, but anyways, the AO pass is going to be coming to an end soon. The highest layers on this whole thing are that like worm-like thing and then the eyelashes, the eyeball, the eyeball pieces, all of that. Um, those are the highest layers in the stack. At this point, uh, there will be another layer that will eventually go on top of that, which is things like the bloom from the shine in the eyes and then the all three eyes and then the, the black outline will eventually get thrown on there as well. Um, you can also see that we've turned off all of the local color on her skin just so that we can treat this material as plainly as possible so that we know where our shadow is going and how it's reacting. If we can get the form to look really good here, once we flip on all of the color variation again, it's just gonna get more exciting. So by trying to get this to work first and uh, trying to make it as good as we can in its dullest form, we know that when we start flipping everything else back on, it's going to get better. Now we're merging together any shadow layers that we had separate, putting the eye in. And now here we go, we flip everything back on. Now we can see the blush in her skin. We can see the um, streaking eyeliner from her mascara, from her like crying thing happening, her, her super gothy thing that she's doing. Um, we've got the brown in her horns back on and the lipstick on and everything. So now everything is completely on that we had previously set up as being an important local color aspect. Now what we're doing is on a new shadow layer, we're putting in those lines I was talking about with the hair. Now we're, as I said, we're not going with super high frequency where we're defining all the individual strands. Instead, we're just going to sort of like a, a subgrouping that's, that's a, a slightly higher frequency than the big chunks overall. That's for a few reasons. One is I don't necessarily love the idea of putting tons of strands of hair in. I like things to be more stylized in general. Uh, also, it helps to not create too much noise, but I'm, I'm saying that because I want to reduce noise and make the image clear, but I think that having that noise around the face can work and then bring all that attention to the face. So that's why I don't like completely leave it out. In fact, I mean, I think Kelly's is an excellent example of that. We've got all this texture around her face and then her face is like the relief, um, which is cool. That type of variance is obviously important. You want to have as much contrast as you can uh, in certain ways, I guess I should say. You shouldn't really go for as much contrast as you can. I should say more that finding interesting contrast makes your piece uh, more fun to look at. And that contrast can be value or detail or whatever, whatever you want it to be. Now we're doing the direct shadow. So this is now, if you're keeping track, our third shadow layer. We've got a shadow layer that is the sort of AO form shadow. Then we have a shadow layer that is the definition of the hair. Then we've got this shadow layer, which is the cast shadow. We're trying to find anything that would be a really strong cast. Now, one thing you might notice if you're keeping score is her horn that is closest to us would probably cast like a really big shadow. And I don't have it cast a really big shadow. That's just because I'm, it's my world. I get to control it. And I didn't want to have like a big shadow that was just sort of casting across her face. I thought that would be too distracting. Even if I pulled it off perfectly, uh, I think that it would just be too much. 
So since we get to control these worlds that we're making, um, I said no and just eliminated that. We will have something that will feel like a shadow. Uh, like you can see right here, we're still casting a shadow around it and everything, uh, but we are not uh, going to have it cast a shadow. But then I do choose to have like the nose cast a shadow because I want to push that nose forward. So again, I never am going for realism. I'm trying to go for something that is usually hinting at something that the brain might think feels tangible or kind of feels real, but I'm not going for something that's totally real. It's just not something I'm interested in. And there's other people out there that do it way better than me, so I'm going to focus on the things I do well and let them do the things they do well. So right now we're just going through and we're making sure that we're trying to replicate lighting in a convincing way. I think that's the key word right there, is convincing. And even though it might be also convincing to have that horn cast a shadow, that doesn't really help us as far as the clarity goes when I was talking about how important clarity is to me earlier. By the way, if you keep seeing that thumbnail kind of disappear and reappear, that's because iMovie has a really annoying limitation where it's picture in picture uh, can only stay up for a certain amount of time and then it goes away and you have to have another one. Um, I could be doing this in LumaFusion, but there are still workflow things in iMovie that are just a little simpler and quicker. So for those of you who've kept with this channel for a long time, you know that these videos have gotten a little bit better production wise over time. And the big thing that I do now is I use LumaFusion for like intros, outros. If I have to do something really complex in the middle of it, LumaFusion is much better than iMovie for those things. But iMovie just flows so much faster. It's a simpler program. And so when you're trying to do simple things, LumaFusion is like you have to do too much to do something simple. So I could do this in LumaFusion, but again, iMovie has a lot of really quick things that'll get me to do it faster. And really all it is is that image like blinks off for a second. Um, so that's why that's, why that's happening. Um, if you're interested in me talking about iMovie or LumaFusion or how I put together my videos, please let me know in the comments below because some people have said that, but I'm not really sure if that's something that a lot of people really want. So if people are really interested in sort of how these videos are built, I'm happy to talk about it. So now we're doing the end of the cast shadows. You can see that I do the cast shadows from the eyelashes because uh, actually if, if you've seen my work for a long time, you know that I love like thick strands of hair casting shadows. It's just funny to me for some reason. And so I wanted to make sure that that got captured uh, here and it wasn't distracting. If those hairs cast all the way across like the iris and the pupil and stuff, I wouldn't do them. Now we're doing a soft shadow around some of the major shapes, just trying to get a little bit of a dark fall off on the, the side where the light would, the opposite side from where the light's coming from, uh, just to give a little bit of extra form. And we're doing that with a soft brush. This goes with something I've been talking about uh, in recent videos where I'm bringing together the rougher uh, turpentine style brush with the soft brush and trying to find this nice little marriage of the two of them so that I can get some texture as well as some of that more refined softness when I need to. Um, you also saw some darkening on her chest just then, and we're going to see it underneath her nose here. This is now another shadow layer with greatly reduced opacity where I'm just trying to bring in some additional support to some of these forms. See a couple more shadow layers come in in the fact that we're going to have a bit of a vignetting of the character, um, a dark, a soft darkening around her, as well as a soft darkening kind of coming up from her, like the, the back of her from the bottom. Uh, and that'll just be to try and pull that attention to the front side of her body and face and a little bit up towards her face. Uh, that's also keying off the original. You can see now I'm putting in those flyaways and the, the dark inky hair in the background. I wanted that back of her to get to black so that we could do that. And you can see in Kelly's, because she goes to black in a lot of spots, that she's able to get that little inky thing to have it just naturally look like a piece that's sort of pulling off the character. And so I needed to get that back to a, a place where it was darkening down to black so I could do the exact same thing. Here, I realized I didn't make this, this worm thing as disgusting as I should have, so I go back in and I add some extra bumps and stuff. In general, I really should have gone for the disgusting angles more, and for some reason I was kind of like blind to it. Like while I was in the middle of doing this, 
I just didn't make it as disgusting as I could have. So that was a bit of a missed opportunity, I'll admit. Now we're going in and putting in highlights. Uh, the highlights in this was were actually a light yellow, if I remember correctly, and then have their opacity reduced. So it's not a highlight or an overlay, or excuse me, it's not an overlay or a add layer or anything like that. It's just reduced opacity. Here on the hair, you can see how clearly that is a yellow layer now. And we're going to be doing the shines like we do, where we are using the same layer as on the body and we are smudging it and getting it into the sort of opacity that we want. And then we'll put on another layer that will be the hotter part of the shine eventually. You can also see we've got some of the shine in the horns now. Uh, again, not as sort of like hard of a shine as we've got in the original, but we're still referencing it properly so that it feels like it is uh, that, that wink that we were talking about. Something I want to reference before we get to it is the pink outline around the stuff that's kind of like in the foreground. Uh, you can see that Kelly does a pink outline around the hand, the worm, and it also kind of goes like onto her back shoulder. I would actually be curious to talk to Kelly to find out why she did that. Um, I think it looks uh, cool and stylish, but I would I would actually like to understand the rationale behind why it does certain things that it does, just as a intellectual art conversation, not as anything more than that. Because uh, when I decided to do it, I actually decided late to do it. I wasn't going to do it because I felt like the angle that my piece was going the direction it was going, that it wasn't going to lend itself well to that, but I felt like it was just too distinct in the original to not do it, so I did include mine, but I followed slightly different rules as to how I represented it. Here we're going with a stronger vignetting so that we can pull more of that attention up, and now we're putting in the bounce. You can see like on her jawline and now on her arm, there's going to be different spots here on her hair where we're putting in this bounce. That's done really simply, it's just on a reduced opacity layer, and then I'm color picking the things that would bounce onto the other things and painting them in. It's all the same opacity, uh, but I will smudge it a little bit more if I need a little bit dimmer, and then if I get into a scenario where something has to be dramatically different, then I will put a new layer down for that. Okay, so now we are doing the lines. Um, I wanted to try and make them somewhat speak to the original. The fact that they exist speaks to the original, but I also really wanted to capture the thick to thin that was happening in the original. If you wanna know the brush that I used for any of this, it's all in my pack, which is in the description down below. It's a very small, simple pack, but all of it except the watercolor was used in this piece. So if you're if you're trying to capture this look, it's those brushes plus the techniques that I talk about. A majority of this was done with the new turpentine brush. The original sketch was done with the new fat pencil. The um, lines was done with the rough ink. Okay, now we're throwing in that outline, that pink outline. You can see that I do follow slightly different rules. I outline more of the hand and kind of separate it from the body. And then I don't include that pink outline on that distant shoulder because I just felt like we were trying to push the worm and the fist kind of forward and that doing that would conflict too much. But I do like it from a stylistic point of view. So I'm glad that it was included because it just, it speaks to the original so much more. Here I thicken it up a little bit too, just because I wanted it to be a little less noisy and a little more there. Sometimes subtlety can be noisy as well too, if it's hard to figure out if it's something supposed to be there or not. Um, so that's, that's that. And then here we go, throwing that texture on at the end. I do a little bit of cleanup, which is what happens when you see some of those layers disappear. And uh, some last minute sort of shines and little tweaks. And there we are at the end. 
This was really fun to work on. Um, some of the stuff I've been doing lately has had some, as I mentioned before, some sort of like valleys of despair and all that. And this one didn't, this was just clear sailing the whole time. I knew since I had, you know, Kelly's as a reference point, I kind of didn't have to make a lot of big decisions. All the decisions were smaller about rendering and everything. So it was nice to just kind of plow through it and have everything come together. Here it is next to the original. So you can see directly some of the decisions that I made that were different. Um, I want to thank Kelly for posting the original there were aspects of this that pulled me out of my comfort zone and it was just fun to do uh, from a design perspective it was very different than what I normally do so it was just it was really fun and it was also a great break in between some of the other things I was doing that was um, let's say more frustrating so it was a nice it was a nice departure so thank you for watching if you enjoyed this video please consider hitting like and subscribe and I will see you on the next one and if you're lurking around the internet and you want to find me, these are some of the places where you can find my old ugly mug.